As we've already reported, seeing Vice President Kamala Harris making history as the first female of Black and South Asian heritage to hold this office is so inspirational. And she has cracked the penultimate glass ceiling, of course. We turn now to Gloria Steinem, the trailblazing journalist and activist, and one of the first to champion intersectional feminism, and also Farai Chidea, host of the podcast Our Body Politic. Both of them join our Michelle Martin to talk about how much this new vice president can achieve. Thanks, Christian. Gloria Stein and Farai Chidea, thank you both so much for being with us. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. You know, it's a pleasure to speak with you both, each of you a trailblazer in your own time and in your own way. So I just wanted to start by asking you as briefly as you can, like, what are your top of the mind reflections on this moment? I mean, on the one hand, this country finally inaugurating a woman and a woman of color as vice president. On the other hand, the legitimacy of that very election challenged by a mob, you know, some of whom, you know, spouting, you know, the most racist, the most anti-Semitic, you know, misogynistic kind of versions of, you know, our national story. So I just want to ask you, so what comes to mind first? Gloria Steiner, I'll start with you. Mm. Well, first, we're getting the virus out of the White House. I mean, I am just so, <laughs> uh, you know, because I have felt the most alienated ever from this country's so-called leadership. And of course, Trump was not elected by a majority vote. He really was illegitimate in so many ways. So I feel as if we're returning to democracy. And then on top of that, that we have Kamala as a vice president, which has been a long time coming. You know, I think that uh, in the public imagination, uh, women and people of color have imagined themselves into that position, at least since Victoria Woodhull and Frederick Douglass, you know, ran for president and vice president in theory. And of course, Shirley Chisholm in my lifetime, who, who all by herself took the white male only sign off the White House door. But that was 50 years ago. So uh, it feels a long time coming and a great relief and as if we're beginning to have an actual democracy in which everyone can imagine themselves in position of leadership. Mm. Cry. Yeah, I would I would echo what Gloria is saying. And you know, America has effectively only had a real democracy, one human, one vote for a little over 50 years, people like Adam Sir were right about this. We have always shut the door on certain populations. First, everyone who was not a landowning white man, uh, then sequentially over time, various people, and, and then up to the civil rights era. And right now, I think what we're seeing in this country is that when women of color lead, when black women lead, we lead on behalf of the body politic. We lead on behalf of everyone. It, we are not trying to leave anyone behind. And we have to just acknowledge, as painful as it is, that uh, certain people put exclusionary leadership as their priority. I will keep power to hold it for myself and people who I like or people who look like me. Mm -hmm. Other people, uh, and I think of Stacey Abrams as well as, uh, you know, uh, former Senator, Vice President-elect uh, Harris, are looking at inclusive leadership. How do I lead on behalf of everyone, including people I might not even like? And that's what we need right now. And I respect and appreciate the fact that both of you are focusing on sort of the larger moment, but I can't get past what happened at the Capitol yeah. uh, just, just literally just days ago, which has occasioned an immense military presence in Washington, even more than usual. Uh, on the occasion of this inauguration. So Farai, you know what? A lot of people profess to be shocked by what happened. Were you? Not at all. I mean, first of all, I went out um, on the morning of uh, January 6th to interview nonviolent Trump supporters who were protesting, including a 26-year-old black man. We have to remember that even though there are strong uh, racial signifiers behind uh, Trump's supporters, that not all of them are white. Um, not all of the Proud Boys are white. And so I have always believed in using field reporting and data to understand this country. If you mm -hmm. use those tools, you would understand that white supremacists are key political organizers in American life and have been since day one, and that the press 
uh, which we love so dearly, Michelle, has suppressed a lot of reporting, including some of my own, on the things that we needed to look at. I feel really heartbroken that there's so much shock in uh, our industry over things that could have been pointed out four years ago, five years ago, or more. I just won't, I mean, there's nothing I can do about journalism as an industry except do my own best work and support other people who do their best work. But dollars to donuts, when you talk to Black and Latino reporters and other reporters of color, they're not shocked. We're not shocked. Mm. Gloria, were you shocked by what happened at the Capitol, the mob invasion yeah, of the I, Capitol? I have to say, I mean, I was a little shocked by its uh, proximity to members of Congress. But I wasn't shocked, I agree with Farai, about the nature of the crowd, because over the last, I don't know, 30 or 40, however long I've been wandering around the country speaking, I would come back to New York and say, you know, there are whole parts of the, especially rural parts of the country where cops are afraid to go, where there are these armed groups that uh, have farms or ranches, uh, who really control the territory. And people would say, oh, no, 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 that's just a small group. But, you know, I, I feel, I agree with Fry that they were always present. And the difference for me was that now they were, you know, in, invading the House of Representatives. Yeah. Go ahead, Fry. Just, just one last thing. I mean, I think also it's about not understanding the ways in which women of color have consistently over-indexed for our contributions to this society. And so when I've talked to several political scientists in the past, some of them were like, well, the only way America will change is if uh, white centrist conservatives can, you know, convince uh, white conspiracist conservatives to come back to the ranch of democracy. And I'm like, look, I can't wait for all that. You know, I'm a black woman who most of the time lives in a majority black neighborhood. We are on the save our own butts plan. and. Mm -hmm. When we try to save our own butts, very often we succeed for the good of all. And I think that very often there's also been this preponderance, both in journalism and in politics, of thinking that the only people who can solve anything are men. Mm -hmm. And the only people who can solve anything are white people. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about Gloria is that she's always had an intersectional feminism when it comes to race. And um, you have to understand that uh, right now we are... We are, we are dealing with a situation that could undermine democracy as we know it, not just right now, which of course clearly it is, but in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And we've got, yeah. we've got to embrace leadership. We are in this moment when uh, the pandemic has been particularly hard on women. Um, we've seen that there are nearly two, there are more than two million fewer women in the labor force in December than there were in February. We saw in December, there was a net loss of 140,000 jobs and women lost all mm -hmm. of those jobs. Women lost 156,000 jobs and men gained a net 16,000. So if you're looking at it at a macro level, all of the net loss was jobs that women had held. On the other hand, we saw going back to the mob at the Capitol, there were women there. Going back to the people who have consistently supported Donald Trump, women have been a very significant part of his coalition, white women, it has to be said. Gloria, do you want to start, first of all, on why it is that the more white women haven't seen Donald Trump in the same way that women of color have? Mm. Well, first of all, there are a proportion of white women who are dependent on the identity and incomes of white men. And so they are voting arguably their interest uh, than not their own interest. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the other and also the overwhelming economic interest of the men they are depend on certainly intervenes. And we have to account for that. So, you know, it isn't, um, you know, and of course, at the same time, as you point out, women are more vulnerable to the pandemic because we're more likely to be in people-related jobs, to be responsible for children, uh, you know, all, all kinds of reasons. But so the proportions change, but nothing is absolute. And we always have to look at the situation of the individual. I think that 
when we look at the political history of white women, we are looking at a large demographic, very diverse within itself, of course, but which has used proxy power of men, um, you know, over and over again to win office. And I would think of, you know, even uh, Phyllis Schlafly, who, you know, uh, Gloria, you went up against, she was really invested in the proxy power that she could hold. She was a very powerful woman, but she veiled it in this idea that she was holding power sort of for white manhood. And the thing is, I'm all for everyone getting power in America, uh, you know, equally. I'm, I'm not out to disenfranchise white men, but very often this argument um, makes it seem as if by simply going for our own equality that we are anti-male or anti-white. But um, just to reinforce what you said, Michelle, uh, there's been a lot of economic analyses. There were one by the, one by the Center for American Progress that found that 67.5% of black women and 41% of Latinas were the the sole household income and overall uh another index found that 67.1 percent of native american mothers and 44 percent of asian american mothers were pulling down at least 40 percent of the household income so proxy power doesn't really work that well for women of color we've got a diy and even people with partners i know a lot of like middle class married black women who are the primary breadwinner and um, that's not unusual it's, it's also says a lot about the ways in which uh, black men and Latino men are undervalued in society as well. So I think that when we look at this situation, I look at um, Vice President Harris as someone who is, you know, really standing up for an ideal of womanhood, which claims its own power, which does not claim proxy power. It's like, she is not coattailing on anyone. She is her own woman. She's, she's stepping up to bat as herself. And that is a very strong message to girls and women everywhere and, and men. I want to talk more about what would make a difference. Um, you know, I remember a conversation some years ago. Um, it was about, at a moment where the LGBTQ community had just made some major advances in legal rights owing to some major Supreme Court decisions. And a woman, she asked the lawyer, you know, why is it that this is moving so quickly when I feel as a woman, we're still fighting for kind of basic recognition, basic sort of rights. And he said, look, as a, a part of the civil rights movement, there were very few black people who stood up and said, I don't want my rights. And there are very few LGBTQ people who stood up and said, I don't want my rights. He said, the problem is that with women, they don't agree. Gloria, what do you think? Is that true? It's, it's certainly true. But I think there's an added element that we need to think about, which is the family and the fact that uh, probably the men were, the, the white guys have all been, and guys in general, but <laughs> have been raised by a woman. Mm -hmm. And they associate female power with childhood. And I noticed this uh, in the treatment of, of Hillary Clinton uh, and others, you know, Shirley Chisholm, that there was a resistance. I mean, Shirley Chisholm always said that the uh, black mm -hmm. political elite in Brooklyn was more a problem for those guys, were more a problem for her than uh, race sometimes, at least in her early years. I, it's, it's as if when men see a powerful woman, they mm -hmm. feel regressed to childhood because that was the last time they saw one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the kind of added element of that. What would make a difference? Well, what makes a difference is seeing women in authority is becoming accustomed to, to women in authority. It's complex and it depends on our situation. But I do think we need to remember that uh, until men and women are raising babies and little children equally, until the family is democratic, we're not going to have democracy. Mm -hmm. Farad, how would you like to see Vice President Harris uh, working with Joe Biden in her role? What do you want to see her do? Well, 
Vice President Harris, uh, Vice President-elect Harris is, is already basically um, tasked with taking a huge amount of responsibility on COVID-19. There's already a Biden-Harris COVID-19 task force. And I think that um, she is being positioned within the administration as a strategist, not just sort of a hangers-on or someone who was on the ticket and you know, for political reasons, but as someone who's a strategist, uh, strategist on criminal justice issues, strategist on uh, economics, uh, women's issues, which are all issues. Um, she knows places like Silicon Valley. So I'm sure that she'll be involved in talks with industry. So from everything I'm hearing so far, um, you know, she is positioned to be a strategist within the administration, which is what she should be. What do you hope the new generation of young women activists will focus on in the days ahead? Well, let me reframe it a little bit, just that I, I hope that it's, it's not just about young women activists who I have so much love for. And one of my uh, teenage goddaughters is an activist and um, you know has been written about for her work. But all, I, when, President Trump was elected. I remember so many parents saying that their teenage girls were sobbing because mm -hmm. the taunts that they got from boys mm -hmm. they thought would get so much worse if someone who said, grab them by the pee was in the White House. Mm -hmm. And girls of all types, activists or not, are very aware of social order. And I hope that this will bring a restoration of social order where they feel empowered to be their own fabulous selves, mm -hmm. you know? And so that the activists do what the activists do, but that girls and young women of all types get to be themselves. Hmm. Lori, what about you? What do you hope the, the, this rising generation of young women activists will focus on? Well, when you were saying that, I, I was thinking that wherever I am in this country or in other countries, what I hear children saying the most often in different languages <laughs> is some version of, you are not the boss of me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that makes me so happy because <laughs> I think mm -hmm. I'm somehow born with this, they're not saying they're going to boss around someone else, though that, you know, we may need to worry about that. But the first thing they say is uh, in Hindi, in French, and so you are not the boss of me, all right? And that, to me, is the basis of democracy. <laughs> Gloria Stein of Fry today. Thank you both so much for speaking with us today. Michelle, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Michelle and Farai, thank you. It's so wonderful to see you. I'm so grateful to see you. Yes, thank yes, you, it thank is. you. <laughs>